Hey everybody, welcome. Thanks for being here this is to the first ever direct from the Cellar Library Napa Valley Wine Auction. My name is Doug Schaefer. I'm a member of the Napa Valley Vintners Board, representing over 500 wineries here in the Napa Valley. Uh, we vintners have done a great job digging into our cellars and coming up with uh, some wonderful, rare library lots to auction off. If you haven't checked out the auction, check it out now at napa.wine, register and start bidding. We partnered with the great auction house of Zaki's. They've been our great partners for this whole deal. Started bidding, started the online bidding last Thursday. We'll finish up this Saturday, February 20th, live streaming starting at three o'clock Pacific time. So check that out. All proceeds will go to promoting, protecting, enhancing our beautiful Napa Valley. Wish you were here today. It's absolutely drop dead gorgeous, but um, I'm not trying to make you jealous. It's just the way it is. Uh, but anyway, to do this whole thing right, we've partnered up with our buddy Antonio Galoni, who's hosting a series of uh, wine information seminars, which have been going on for the last few days, and we'll, there's a couple more to go, uh, hosting some of our really nice, good winemakers. There's a lot of good ones out here. So you're gonna see a few today. Antonio Galoni, um, founder, CEO of Venice, one of the world's most influential, influential wine publications. He's the uh, lead critic covering California, Bordeaux, Italy, and Champagne. He was formerly lead critic for Robert Parker's uh, The Wine Advocate. Uh, currently, he and his team have also been producing some really killer vineyard Appalachian maps. You've got to check those out. He's a MBA, he has an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management. He's a Berkeley trained musician. When he's not tasting wine, he's hanging out with family, working out, and shredding the guitar. I need to turn it over to our good friend, Antonio Galoni. Take it away, man. Doug, thanks so much for that incredible welcome. I hope I can live up to it. Um, it's an absolute thrill to be with you today. Um, we're going to have, we have a, a fantastic seminar lined up. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the panelists are awesome. We've got some really great wines to talk about. We'll talk about the auction lots um, in a second. And the theme today this is the fourth of our Napa Valley sessions. The theme today is we're going to explore the down valley. So some of the, uh, the Appalachians in the south, so we'll talk about Stag's Leap. We'll go south, work our way down, uh, passing through Signorello to Coombsville. Um, so, so three areas to talk about, um, and we'll wrap up the, uh, the series uh, tomorrow with a look at uh, varieties outside of Napa Valley Cabernet, because uh, the, the Napa Valley is an extraordinarily uh, varied place, and it's, it's much more than just Cabernet. So we'll talk about that tomorrow, but today we're going to focus on the Down Valley, and uh, we've got a, a great audience as well. We've got over 100 people dialed in already. Uh, just a few minutes past the hour. And the goal is to make these really interactive. So I'd encourage you to throw your questions into the Q&A. It's a really uh, rare opportunity to be able to ask these winemakers pretty much whatever you want. So I'd encourage everybody watching to, to please give us your questions. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce our four panelists and then we're gonna walk through each of the estates, each of the, there's four wines uh, to talk about, but you know, we'll basically just explore the nuances of each of these sites, what makes them unique, um, so please um, help me welcome our four panelists, starting with Elias Fernandez, who's been at Schaefer for more than 30 years. He uh, has an extraordinary background, including being a Fulbright, having been awarded, a, having won a Fulbright Music Scholarship for Jazz Studies at the University of Nevada. Uh, he followed that up with uh, an enology degree at UC Davis. So that's a, like an unbelievably diverse and varied background. So Elias is here from Schaefer. So thank you, Elias, for being here. Um, and we have, uh, as I said, in the order, uh, then we're going to go just south to Signorello. Uh, and we're joined by Priyanka French, who took the helm uh, at Signorello in 2019 after working at a number of illustrious properties, including, including Dalla Valley. And Signorello, to me, is, a, is an estate that's in this, um, this sort of rebirth, uh, sort of a whole new generation. I think there's a lot of topics to talk about there, everything from viticulture to winemaking. So thank you for being here, Priyanka. It's going to be great. Um, and then we're going to uh, move on to, to Celia Welch, who every year in Napa Valley, Celia, you put on this incredible tasting. I get to taste all of your consulting projects. Uh, one of them happens to be Signorello, but there's also 
uh, you know, you've made Scarecrow for years, you make the Davies wines, you've worked before at Staglin, you have your own label, Cora, and today we're going to uh, we're going to focus on Rio, which is one of your newer projects from Coombsville, and uh, really excited to sort of pick your brain on, on Coombsville and what makes that unique. And then we're going to wrap up with Julian Fayard, uh, who I met for the first time when he worked with Philippe Melka. Uh, but you've worked, uh, but uh, Julian has worked at some pretty illustrious properties, including Lafitte and Smith of Lafitte. Uh, it makes wines for a number of labels, including uh, several of his own. We'll be tasting one of the Perlieu wines from the Tusser Vineyard and talking about Coombsville again. So uh, welcome all of you. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's just jump right in. Um, and I'm just going to repeat to our audience, you know, uh, don't be shy. Please ask questions. You know, pour yourself a glass of wine. Um, I am. This is 2010 Schaefer Hillside Select, which happens to be one of my uh, my favorite wines from the estate. Uh, so Elias, you know, it's it's curious. Um, I don't know. If, I think Doug is still on, but Doug's dad, John, is one of the first winemakers I ever met in Boston. So when I was selling wines, I was an unemployed musician waiting tables. And I went to this tasting that was John Schaefer and um, and John Williams from Frogsley. And and uh, that was like one of my very first sort of tastings of Napa Valley wine. So Schaefer, I've been following these wines for a long time and uh, it's just a thrill to have you. So thanks for joining us, Elias. Well, thank you. Great, great to be here. Thank you and the Napa Valley Vintners for uh, asking me to be here. It sounds exciting. Super exciting. So. I want to start with Stag's Leap because it's, um, you know, it's maybe not, it's oddly enough, not quite as famous, quote unquote, as maybe some of the other regions that we've covered in some of these other seminars. Yesterday it was Rutherford, we've talked about Oakville, but Stag's Leap is the, is the appellation in which the world discovered Napa Valley wines, at least the world of our generation, you know, sort of our times, um, through the judgment of Paris. Uh, and that was really the first time that American wines were viewed as being equal to, or maybe even greater than the great wines of France, especially at the time, and that now, you know, being among the great, one of the great regions of the world. But what is it about Stag's Leap that's unique in your view? You've spent 30 years at Schaefer. What is it about Stag's Leap that's different from some of the Appalachians a little bit north? Sure. So um, one of the first things is the, the temperature variation. Um, you did a panel on, um, on Oak, Oakville. Uh, where the temperatures are real high and we get that same type of heat, but we also get those cool nights. Uh, we're very close to the San Pablo Bay uh, and Schaefer tends to be a little valley within the valley uh, where the winds just funnel through and cool the, um, the vines down in the evening. So we can be in a, in a hundred degrees uh, in the afternoon and then we can cool down to, you know, 55, 50 degrees at night. So um, that tends to you know, allow the grapes to be on the vine for a long time, hold on to their acidity and, uh, you know, make wines that are, uh, have a lot of energy and life to them. Yeah. And, um, and we're, we're going to put up a map here in a second, um, of Stag's Leap just to show folks where that is, um, the valley within the valley, but tell us about the 2010 vintage. I'm curious, because that was a, a vintage that was, um, really tricky. It was cold throughout most of the year. And, uh, but then uh, I think a lot of people de-leafed also maybe a little too aggressively, but then you got this really burnt, this, what often happens in Napa Valley, this, um, this heat at the end of the season. And so the wines have this ripeness as well. What, what do you remember about that vintage? Yeah, so it, it started, up, started off wet, uh, wet winter, and then the spring was really cool. Uh, but the set was uh, really uh, re set really well um, uh, because the daytime temperatures were just about right for a fruit set. And then uh, throughout the summer, we really only had um, uh, two or three um, uh, days of 100 degrees. So the rest of the time, the grapes spent uh, 80 to 90 degrees. So um, it allowed for the flavors to develop, the color to develop. Uh, and to hold on to some of that acidity that makes uh, longevity, uh, you know, uh, great in Cabernet. Yeah, uh, I mean, this wine is showing beautifully. We, you know, I've, I, I bought this wine actually, um, and uh, it's just always been really exotic and like a real showstopper. Um, hopefully, you can see the map. Can you see the map? Yes. Yeah. So uh, we've we've addressed some of our technology challenges. 
But I thought it'd be fun to just show Stag's Leap. We're going to show Stag's Leap, and then we're going to go down uh, to, to where Signorello is and, and Kumsville. We don't have maps for those areas, but hopefully soon. But maybe this can be a, a representation, Elias, and you can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm just a wine taster. But we'll show the valley within the valley. But this is Stag's Leap here, and it sort of starts with these Cliff Lady properties. So poetry is where the inn is, Twin Peaks, and you work your way down here. Um, a lot of people don't know that um, one of the main components for the Phelps Insignia wine is Stag's Leap fruit. So one of those ranches is here, Barbosa. You just go down south. And so this is where you are. Um, here's you know the Schaefer Ranch here. And you can see the there's the first influence of these other mountains, the Palisades. It goes up to 1,200 feet. When we did this map, I really wanted our cartographer to show the, the mountains because I think that the that's a, such a big um, part of what makes Stag's Leap special. Wildfoot is a wine made by Russell Bevan. You can see here, this is Stag's Leap Winery. We go down here south, and then this all used to be one ranch here, this old Stelzner Ranch, which has Phelps La Roque, um, the Phelps Las Rocas Ranch, and then Odette in the front, Lindstrom, which Celia makes. It's a very rocky site and very, you can see how parcelated it is there. And then as we move down south, and so this is, so this is the valley within the valley, right? Uh, Eli Elias up here, this, this gap here, which is yes, what's yes. there. And uh, this, is, this is made up about 13,000 um, acres of, uh, um, of grapes. And, you know, if you were to drive from Yonville to the end of Stag's Leap and go at the speed limit, it takes about four minutes. So it's a very small part of the Napa Valley, uh, but very unique. Uh, you have the volcanic soils like we have here at Schaefer Vineyards, um, where the top soil is 12 to 24 inches. And then you, as you go down we, uh, in the, into the lower parts, uh, you have a little clay loam, and, but the same um, microclimate influence of uh, hot days, cool nights, and wind. Yeah, and we've talked about that in some of the other seminars, the diurnal shifts, which to me are such a key thing about Napa Valley. And it's not unlike any other region that I know where the, you know, the difference between the daytime highs and the nighttime temperatures can be so severe especially like a lot of times when I'm tasting, you know, with you guys, like it's September, October, like the summer, like the daytime can feel like you're almost, you can walk around in like shorts and a t-shirt and then at night you're like freezing cold, you know, it's massive. Um, so let's take, continue this trip down. Thank you, Lars. We're going to, we're going to end up at Signorello pretty soon. But so these are historic ranches from Stag's Leap Wine Cellars, the Fay and the SLV ranches here. This is the Realm property. This is the Hartwell property, which now is part of Realm. And if you know these wines, this is where they make this is this new Hartwell wine that they have is from here. And this is what they call Moonracer here. A lot of people don't know that Robert Mondavi is the, one of, is the largest landowner of Stag's Leap. So that's, that's all their ranch here. They make a beautiful Stag's Leap wine, I should say. Claude Duval, the Ragushi Ranch, that's another historic property. This is uh, Tom Fudo's two ranches here. This is a beautiful Stag's Leap wine here. Chimney Rock with the original Hirondel parcel there. Um, and then the Schaefer borderline, that's your vineyard where you make, you use a lot of that for 1.5, correct? Correct, correct. So that right there is probably the coldest uh, vineyard we have. Um, it usually ends up being picked uh, towards the end of October, uh, early November. Um, so um, as you go south, it gets colder. I mean, that right there is, I pick grapes uh, at night. So sometimes they come in at 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So it gets pretty cold at night during you know late summer yeah and so that is really one of the themes that we wanted to highlight in this seminar is that the the more south you get the cooler it gets and we're going to talk about coonsville in a few minutes but that's an appellation that first of all it's a fairly recent ada but also there's some unbelievable wines coming from there including the wines we're going to taste today but um, you know paul hobbs has made a big investment there um, we had andy erickson um, and Annie, Annie Fabia on some of the preceding installments and they're making beautiful wines there. They have a home ranch there. And it's this area that's really, I think, blossoming, especially in the last 10 years or so with the arrival of some really important um, new ownership and the sort of the, the uh, rise in quality. You know, Realm has the Pharrella vineyard. There's, there's, uh, there's the whole slew of transactions down there in recent years that I think are gonna really draw even more attention to Coombsville. Before we get to Coombsville, we're going to, Elias, just go down to your neighbor, just a few doors down, basically, uh, at Signorella with Priyanka French. Priyanka, thanks so much for being here. And uh, 
you know, we'll talk about the auction lot wines in a bit, but tell us about Signorello and what's unique, but also, you know, you've, you've just sort of completely revolutionized the place. So what's, what's going on? Thank you, uh, Antonio. Very excited to be here. And actually, before I get into Cinerello, you know, my romance with this uh, corner of Napa started uh, early on when I did an extended internship at Stag's Leap Winery. And I would sneak over, you know, as close to not trespassing the Schaefer Vineyards and kind of explore that whole canyon quite a bit. So I've always, you know, had a <laughs> very soft spot for this corner of Napa. And some of the reasons that Elias mentioned are why, you know, I think that the fruit that we get from this corner of Napa is so nuanced in so many different ways. And, you know, winemakers have really kind of made that push to start to express that nuance of this corner of Napa, which I'm very excited about. Um, coming to Signorello, you know, the, the, the estate has been around for uh, quite a while, Ray Signorello senior who was nicknamed Padrone, which is uh, one of our lots for the auction, bought this property actually in the 80s, though he knew about it all, all the way out into the 60s. It used to be uh, an area where they stabled horses that would race at the Berkeley uh, horse racing field. So uh, we've uh, been farming this property now for about 30 years. It's a 30 acre estate. And uh, in 2019, I came on board uh, and we brought along Steve Mathison, who is our consulting viticulturalist, and Celia, who is uh, right here on our panel, who is our consulting winemaker, because we really uh, we really feel like there's so much that needs to be expressed off the Signorello terroir. It is a very unique uh, property, even for this corner. One of uh, the components that Elias mentioned in terms of soil composition was kind of our first hint towards that. You know, we noticed right away that there was a lot more volcanic rock in this little knoll that we sit on. And uh, the clay content really is just in the front of our vineyards closer to Silverado Trail. Everything else is more heavy on, on the loam side. And so we saw right away that there was a, a very kind of like a earlier ripening component compared to the rest of our neighbors at Signorello. And we've been pushing for that. We've been doing a lot of uh, precision viticulture with Steve. It's something that he excels in, I've been learning with him now for about six years. And so we've made quite a few changes to our vineyard, not from a replant point of view, we definitely want to preserve um, the age of our vineyard. Our Chardonnay block was planted in 1980. Our cab is mainly planted in 92 with a small parcel in 2002. So we have some good vine age. We're getting some really great expression of fruit from the property. and. Um, 2019 will be our first official vintage, though we did do quite a bit of work with 2018. So we're very excited. We think that, you know, there's always been a legacy of great wines out of Signorello and uh, we're very excited to continue that moving forward. Yeah, I mean, you've really kind of re-energized that property, not that it wasn't energized before, but I mean, there's just a, a real change. Um, and I think that yeah. that's, you know, one of the most exciting things that you can see in Napa Valley is, is, um, you know, this, this, um, you know, when there's a new generation that comes in and takes over a property, you can really see like this renewed, renewed energy. Um, and um, it's always fascinating to see. Um, so your top wine, Padron, you don't make that every year. So is it a selection of blocks? Or is it more sort of what happens in the barrel? A bit of both. So actually the picture that's on the screen right now, I just want to point out the these are our back vineyards and our front vineyards, which you kind of see as you're driving down Silverado Trail, are very different from the back vineyards, which again is like a valley within a valley, like what Elias was mentioning. And if you were to hike down this back canyon all the way in the back, you would eventually, you know, get to where Schaefer and Quixote and Slightly wow. Winery is. And so this side of our property is very cool. Um, just from the weather station data that we've accumulated in the last two years, we've found already a significant difference between our front vineyards and our back vineyards, not just in terms of heat, but uh, growing degree days, rainfall that we catch, you know, solar exposure, there's a pretty big difference. And the Padrone ends up being, uh, in most vintages, a blend between the two parcels, if you will, of our estate vineyards. So, 
the front vineyards with the Western exposure tend to give us a lot of power and a lot of concentration of fruit. And the back vineyards kind of preserve those more delicate nuances. Uh, it's always colder in the back. Uh, picking at night in the back is uh, brutal because <laughs> you have to have at least two gloves on. It's always so cold. Uh, but the fruit is so delicate and it preserves this very nuanced violet and black currant character that we truly enjoy. Uh, so the Padrone is our flagship Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, it used to be called the Founders Reserve before Ray Senior, who was the original proprietor, passed away. And then it got renamed to the Padrone kind of in an homage to our original founder. And um, it was something that was a vintage specific wine, but as we've gotten to know the property better, we have a better understanding of the blocks that we know will make the Padrone cut. So now it kind of comes as a combination of both the front and the back vineyards. Uh, and in my opinion, kind of really expresses what the range of this property is and what it can do. Well, that's a, that's a great explanation. So <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Three, you know, is uh, showing great. It's still very young and still full of life. I mean, obviously, it shows a style of wine that was more prevalent, you know, more like in favor 20 years ago. But mm -hmm. uh, it's really beautiful. So that, that's great. Um, so we're going to move to Coonsville, and we're going to go to Rewa, which is a property named over the after the owner's wife, Celia. And. Um, you know, one of my favorite things that I get to do is I get to taste a lot of wines when they're just getting started or even before they're even launched. And this is one of the wines that, that we've tasted together, the Rewa wine, since it was first produced. And I, I got to tell you, that is my favorite thing of this entire job is sort of seeing these new things. So, uh, but you work with some really prestigious properties. Um, I mentioned Scarecrow, JJ Cohn Vineyard. Um, the first time I met you were also making wine at Kelly Fleming or, or consulting and you sort of seen the whole, all of the valley. So what is it about this part of, of the valley, the down valley in Coombsville that is so, uh, that, that, that is so intriguing? Why are these wines so interesting? You know, I, there are probably at least a dozen different factors, right? I mean, we've touched on the fact that uh, you're a little closer to San Pablo Bay, the upper the upper lobe of San Francisco Bay. So closer to that really cold body of water gives you a little more fog. It gives you some colder breezes, preserves the acidity in the fruit. Um, soils wise, uh, Stag's Leap District is kind of a combination of of some you know clay loam soils, but also some very shallow rocky soils and Coombsville, same thing. Um, we've got some very rocky soils. We've got a lot of, um, of uh, tough there and also some marine soils. Um, and I would say similar to Stag's Leap District, uh, this particular vineyard is quite close to the Eastern Hills, um, which are probably about the same elevation, I would guess, as Stag's Leap, probably in the 12 to 1600 foot um, topping off there. And so you get these cold drafts coming from the the cold air that's up on top of those hills. And, and uh, there's this kind of inversion that happens uh, in the afternoons and evenings as the, the air is mixing and you feel these cold drafts coming down from the hills. And all of that is just like turning an air conditioner onto the fruit. It, it just preserves all the, the vibrancy of the color and the acidity of the flavors. Um, so as a winemaker, that means that we get a little more time each um, growing season to choose that point where the flavors are fully developed and you know we've got great ripeness in the fruit without getting any of the you know more caramelized and raisiny characters in there so we're we're trying to preserve a, an intensity of bright fresh fruit and all of these colder regions i think are really good at doing that so like when i taste these the rewa wines i mean they have obviously this intense concentration of napa valley fruit but this real kind of saltiness and savoriness that's very unique. I mean, yesterday we were talking about Rutherford and Rutherford, you know, mythical Rutherford dust, you know, and uh, which I, I believe in, it's not like I'm making fun of it, but I mean, that's such a signature of these wines. And when we move here, these wines are so salty and saline. I mean, you can just feel them like on the tip of your tongue and they have this very distinct floral um, and herbal quality, not a vegetal quality, but 
definitely a more savory note, almost like a whole cluster character, but it's not. And so do you think that that's the, the, the especially strong diurnal shifts in a longer growing season that does that? Yeah, I think it's, again, I think it's, it's getting back to those, those cooler ripening conditions. Um, those, those floral notes, um, you know, you see them in a, in a cold climate Pinot Noir and you go, oh yeah, this is, this is gorgeous. This is a cold climate Pinot Noir. But you don't always see those in Cabernet because it takes kind of a unique situation where you can have a, a, a place that is warm enough to get the Cabernet completely ripe and cool enough that you don't blow out those really delicate floral notes. So um, in a war, like you wouldn't get that out of a Rutherford. You would never guess that this is a Rutherford Cabernet. It doesn't smell like it. It doesn't taste like it at all. Uh, it's a it's a cooler place that can that can capture those really really tender delicate nuanced aromas and not lose those um, you know in the in the first couple of days of fermentation say yeah uh, so yeah and 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 in terms of just kind of the overall color and and tannin it's amazing we we crush this stuff and I can go to that tank three hours after crushing and it is dark purple. It looks like Petit Verdot. And, you know, I, I, the first couple of years I was doing, it's like, oh, am I, am I at the wrong tank? <laughs> you know, is this really my Cabernet? Uh, the, the color release from the skins is phenomenal. And it's something that every time I have a, a new harvest intern, you know, working with me, this is not one, again, it's the cooler side. It's not one of my first, first uh, vineyards in. It's not one of my, my first fermentations. And, and it always draws a comment from the from the person who's who's really just looking at these brand new fermentations for the first time. It's fun. Yeah, no. Uh, I want to ask you because every time I go down to that part of Napa Valley, it's a few things that really are striking. But since I haven't done a map of it yet, I may be completely off. So please correct me. But I get the feeling. First of all, it feels much more rustic and pastoral, almost more like Sonoma than Napa Valley. You know, lots of ranches and you know, not necessarily, it doesn't seem quite as um, focused just on grapes. There's, it, it seems like there's just more open land. Um, I get a sense that the, the terrain is less even. Uh, as we also have that question in the chat, but it's, it, you get this feeling that the properties are smaller and that there's more diversity in like exposures and contours. Is that just my imagination or is that part of what makes that area maybe a little bit different from some of these other areas when as soon as you get up, you know, on Highway 29 or the Silverado Trail in some areas, all you see is vineyards. Coombsville doesn't look like that at all, I think. So what's your, how should we be thinking about that area? Well, I mean, in terms of the, the larger context of Napa Valley, you know, certainly up going up Highway 29, we've got wineries that were, that were famous in the 1800s, right? And some of that is because there was good water availability and because back when wineries were all gravity flow and the horses were bringing the, the wagon loads of grapes up to Inglenook or, you know, Christian Brothers or whatever, you, you needed to have a close hillside, you know, and enough drop to be able to actually physically move the product around. So, so those places needed to be up against a, a really steep hill. And most of those places, not all of them, but many of them were along the kind of the Western Ridge lines because again, irrigation wasn't a thing. You needed enough rainfall. and. Coombsville is a drier area. It's a little, even though it's close to the bay, it's further from the Western Hills that, that give a, the rain shadow effect onto those Western vineyards. So um, there's limited water. Um, this was an area that when I came to Napa Valley in the eighties was best known for a lot of ranching. There was a lot of uh, dairy ranching and some cattle ranching out there. I think some sheep as well. Um, there are areas that have a lot of basalt outcroppings so not every place is tillable. I've, you know, I've seen vineyards where they've got vines and then there's a big gap of about 12 feet where there's no vines because, you know, there's a great big piece of basalt hanging up and, and you can't, you certainly can't grow a, a vine there, even if you could, uh, you know, somehow blast a hole in the rock, it, it's not going to work. So um, not every place is a good planting place, I would say, in Coombsville. Um, the um, the lack of of commercial development just speaks to the the ranching out there. I mean, there's a um, there is a kind of a Grange co-op barn out there where people used to have gatherings. I think there may be one or two small small little grills or restaurants or whatever, but not much out there. It's, it's mostly um, still either 
horses and cattle or, or a few smaller vineyards. Yeah, so, and I don't think there's a lot of tasting rooms either. So it's not a place where most visitors would go and spend time. And I think that's part of what makes it, um, that's part of the charm, you know, it sort of feels, it's not, nothing against, of course, you know, the, the big wineries, some that you mentioned that are on the main roads, but those are real commercial operations geared towards receiving large numbers of people. I don't know if there's anything like that in Coombsville. And I think that that makes kind of getting lost around there charming in a way that's not really possible once you get into like the real heart of the valley. So, so thanks. So, so your, your wine is, is, is showing beautifully. This is, I mean, it's a 16 because you've only been making this wine for a few years, but uh, it's showing beautifully. And it, to me, it's a classical, it's classic Coombsville Cabernet with all of those savory floral qualities. Um, so thanks. It was great. Thank you. I'm sure we'll come back to you with questions because we've got a ton of them. But before we get to that, I want to bring in Julian Fayard. Um, Julian, how are you? Hi, uh, very good, thank you. I like your background. Looks like one of our tastings. <laughs> All right. Um, you I make a lot of different wines, but tell us about Purlieu. Yeah, so Purlieu, the Tusser Vineyard, uh, some people that have been collecting wine for many years used to know it under the Fraser Vineyard. And uh, it, was, it was a vineyard planted by John Caldwell. Um, and Purlieu, we, we bought that estate and then we sold it, but we kept getting allocation from fruit every year. So we started to make wine in 2009 from there uh, and I've been making wine every single year. So for me, that site uh, specifically, it's an older vineyard that was really challenged. Uh, like Priyanka said, uh, we had Steve Mayas, Matthiasson and uh, Gary Buckland help us. We re-energized the vineyard. We kept those old vines and the idea was um, you know, when, when I came here, the vision, uh, especially in Coombsville, which is a newer AVA, is what do those wines over time. And now we're starting to see wines, you know, 10 plus year uh, on them and see how they change and the consistency over time. And that's really the exciting part of Coombsville. I think the fact that the AVA got a name um, is very important because now we isolate it uh, and it has an identity. So there is little more communication about it. It took a couple of years, uh, you know, it was what, 2012, 2013, the AVA got in place. And, um, and it takes a couple of years to get into the market and to get people educated about it. Um, I like to say for me that it's, uh, it's not cold per se. We talk a lot about cool, uh, but it's the last one to warm up and the first one to cool down. And that those uh, entries from the bay uh, helps cool down and it helps buffer the effect of the weather. I think in California, we fight the sun. It helps us ripen those wines to a beautiful level, but sometimes can be scorching and can be damaging. And where other areas in the world are challenged by rain and hail or challenged by the heat. And Coombsville has a natural buffer for that, which is very interesting. Um, and like everything needs a bit of yin and a yang, uh, we're getting pretty dramatic exposure, very shallow soils, not a lot for the vines to explore. And so that brings a certain stress and a certain um, tension in the wines um, that balance that cool weather. So it's always for me, especially for the two sir we're, we're having today, uh, the site is really, you know, the time on the vine is very important and the longer I can I can hang it, uh, the more complex the tannin, the more layers. It's always, this site particularly is a south facing site, very steep, very shallow soil. Um, there is not a lot of southern exposure in Coombsville. Um, and, and so that was exciting to capture this in the vault. Um, what you were saying about the different aspect is, is, is very, it's something that is starting to fall in place. Uh, we have the first, we have three avenues in Coombsville, first, second, and third. And it's interesting because the gradient of temperature follows the avenues. The first avenue is warmer, second is a little bit cooler, and third, you even find pinots there. Like the Monk Vineyard makes beautiful pinots, and it's really the coolest part. So Farella is kind of at the edge of like almost too cool for Cabernet Sauvignon. And then on the top of the vineyard is uh, uh, ripe for Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so you get all that complexity in the different sites. The fact that it was uh, mostly a place where people lived uh, with ranches and homes, uh, there was a small development of farming or people switched from uh, horse ranch to farming, but it was still like two acre, four acre vineyards 
really tiny pieces. And I think with the landscape today, if someone wants to come in and put in a winery or build a large vineyard, they're gonna have to buy a succession of small and which is make it very costly is therefore very challenging to grow anything of large scale in Brazil. So it's gonna be for the collectors and the ones that are curious, it's always gonna be a little bit of an exploration to discover each vineyard. Yeah, uh, no, that's really cool. I think it's, it's you touched on a lot of things that are really fascinating that could be the subject themselves of an entire hour long conversation. It seems though, if I understood correctly, that that the whole growing season has shifted late, late to warm up and, and late to warm up and late to cool. Is that correct? Or is it a longer growing season? I think it's a long, uh, longer growing season, but it's also within the day. And that day in our change, uh, we're, we're going to have a little more cool weather. You know, instead of warming up at 9, 10 a.m., it might be more like 10, 11. But that's an extra less hour on the whole season. Which And then the cooling effect, especially, I mean, I have some sites that are full is facing so in addition to the wind at 3 p.m we don't have any sun and the 3 p.m sun can be a very damaging sun because you get that heat accumulated from the day and on top you get the direct ray from the sun and and the berries i mean we had a couple of years like 15 that were since were really damaged um and, and that we don't have in Brazil, and that's where almost we don't have to worry when there is those heat events uh about any direct sun exposure so the canopy management can be a little bit different we can open up the canopies it, it's it's uh for me it's not a little more relaxed farming but it's i'm less concerned with the extreme of the vintage mm -hmm. and i'm gonna have a little more reliability from year to year which is which is great because then we don't have to modify too much the wine making behind it and it leaves a little more room for the fruit to express the site um, so like if you do, we did a vertical of the tuser and that's like, and people can really see the difference uh, of the vintage because it's really textbook what the vintage is bringing to the vineyard. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. I mean, I think that, yeah, I, mean, I think Coombsville, I mean, may, may not have the large properties, but it's got some vineyards that people are learning more about. Meteor has been one of them for a long time, Caldwell. And then you have these new, newer entrants, like we mentioned, Realm with Farella. Um, you have uh, the Lawrence family, which owns Heights Vineyard. They bought a historic vineyard called Hain. I'm, I'm not Haynes, Haynes, not Hain, Haynes. I'm not sure what they're going to call that necessarily now, but it's a, a very well-known property for super high quality grapes. Um, there's new projects like, like Rewa. Um, and um, I don't, I'm not sure if I mentioned the Paul Hobbs major development there with the Nathan Coombs estate um, and the Erickson 95. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's, we're going to be hearing more and more about these wines I and mean, so it's really exciting to see like this whole ABA be born and be able to taste these wines. Um, I think we've got some fantastic questions and I want to make sure we get to as many of them as we can. Celia, th there's a lot of questions about um, about how winemaking has evolved over the last decade or so. What's what's your view on like how has your approach changed let's say from 10 years ago versus today? Um, well, certainly there's more technology available in the vineyard. So, you know, we've got a lot more, a lot more information about how the season is progressing, um, you know, what's happening on these, these warmer days and how are we, um, how are we best helping the vines get through hot spells with, you know, strategic irrigation, um, things like shade cloth that can help protect them in the warmest areas from uh, excess heat or um, UV. Um, um, in the winery, I would say that there's a lot more um, emphasis on measuring, you know, tannins and the ways that, um, you know, more metrics available to us to, to try to put numbers to what we're tasting. Um, I would also say, you know, maybe I'm just old school enough that I still don't think anything really um, can outweigh the, the palate. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think that what you're tasting ultimately is, is what you end up making the decisions on, regardless of a spreadsheet that has a lot of numbers on it. Um, I, I really think that the biggest improvements have been in um, in viticulture, in finding better plant material, in um, in figuring out better ways to irrigate, and and this this emphasis of of just very very minute 
areas of, of differentiation between this block and that block or between this row of vines and that row of vines and making sure that the people that are that are making decisions, whether it's canopy management or pruning or whatever, are paying attention to um, the, the small differences within a row of grapes. Um, and I would say the other thing that I, you know, I, I guess on a broader scale is that I think that there's been a broader acceptance of, a, of more different kinds of styles. I think that back in the 90s, somewhere, somebody got hooked on the idea that that bigger and higher alcohol and and thicker wines were somehow better. And I am really glad to see that change. Um, um, that was never my my winemaking style personally anyway, but I just think that that there's a there's a return to the understanding of elegance and grace and complexity that maybe wasn't being um, heated as much. It wasn't emphasized as much 10, 15 years ago. I'll tell you, tasting Napa Valley wines is so much fun because there is so much diversity of places, but styles and approaches. And the, it's, hard, it's not like essentially impossible to keep up with it all, but it's nice. To, it's fun to try. But you mentioned something which is farming. And I couldn't agree with you more just to build on that because I have seen it myself where a new vineyard management company or a new vineyard manager comes in and literally within a year, you can see a difference in the wine. In the wine now, usually one, it's I, I think unusual that a winery would change one thing. Usually, it's kind of part of a bigger philosophical change. So, it's it's it may be more than one change, but you can see some pretty dramatic influences. At least to me, when I taste the wines, you can see some pretty dramatic changes just in a single year. And I think one of the biggest changes that follows on from that is that people are picking in smaller lots because they've, they've done more work to understand their vineyard. Therefore, they understand these differences like Elias was talking about at Schaefer where like the, the terrain is different and that's a pretty big ranch but Signorello is smaller and still the, the idea that there's a lot of diversity even within a single property. If you look at the old USGS maps, not that there's anything wrong with the government research, but it would tend to lump all of these areas into fairly broad classifications of soils. Are. And then when you, when you really dig into the detail, you get much more nuance. And I think because of that, people are, they're doing smaller picks, more micro picks, because they've done this work that you've talked about, Celia, to really understand their ranch and like each little block. And you can really taste that in the wines. We had a, the first seminar that we did in this series was young winemakers. And there were some wines from the 90s and there were some wines from present day. And wines from the 90s, there was um, a 95 Bryant Estate and 18 Bryant Estate. And then um, there was a 93 Harlan and a 16 Harlan. And to me, there's just no comparison. I mean, nothing against those wines from the 90s. They were very important in building the, that generation of Napa Valley. But you taste the wines today and they just seem to have this extra precision and, and nuance and detail. It's sort of like looking at a really crisp picture versus looking at a picture that's crisp but not quite as crisp. And so I, I think it's kind of a golden age. When you taste these wines of today, they're just, they're just beautiful. Um, but I want to just take some more questions. There's one for you, Elias, about the Stag's Leap Palisades and um, from Bill. What do you think the, what is the effect of that, of the, of those mountains on growing grapes? Uh, is, is heat being trapped as well? Or is it, you know, tell us a little bit about those mountains. Those are the mountains I showed in the map at the beginning, the brown ones that go up to about 1200 feet. What, what right. is the difference? Yeah, so uh, the, those mountains have crumbled over the years and eroded down you know, towards the, the valley. And they, have, they produce the soils that we grow grapes on. Um, we have uh, about 48 acres here that are planted and there's about 18 different blocks. And so um, I get to see the influence of the hills. I mean, as you go up, the, the soils are more shallow, you know, like again, 12 to 24 inches. So the vines struggle. I have to be watching the water uh, for sure, um, we, you know, we talked a little, little bit about technology. Well, in the old days, it was all gut feel on when to water and so forth. One of the beauties of the new technology, such as sap, sap flow uh, sensors and uh, you know um, uh, stuff like that, is I can actually see what the reaction is uh, of the vine to watering and so forth. So um, I, I use a lot of that on the uh, top of the hills. On the bottom, um, you know, you get a little more thicker soils. Um, 
uh, they drain really well also, but they, their holding, water holding capacity is better. So um, I'm able to let them uh, you know, hang a little longer without irrigation, produce smaller berries. And my goal is to make the bottom uh, lots as good as the top ones so that when I blend hillsides left, uh, I have a lot to choose from. So, uh, but those hills are, um, you know, uh, really what has given the, the bottom some, uh, you know, great soils to deal with. So, yeah, it's interesting. The answer is not always the obvious answer. It may, it may not be about the hills themselves, but what they've contributed to the, to the dirt that where you actually are growing grapes, right? That's, I never thought about it that way. That's really fascinating. Uh, Priyanka, you've spearheaded this, uh, this uh, project at Signorella to really re rethink farming. What, what, is, what are your thoughts on sustainable farming, biodynamic, organic? Um, do you think that these, do, these, do these designations matter or are you more of a practical person where you're sort of more about um, sort of like what is needed in each vintage? How are you farming your, your property? Uh, that's a really good question because I've actually been pondering it myself in many ways. Uh, I think a, a, a huge inspiration for me, I definitely believe in sustainability. A huge part of the initiative at Signorello is to channel that, not just in the vineyards, but as a part of the construction of the new estate. You know, we're looking at building materials. How are we using energy resources? Are we using them efficiently? When it comes to farming, I think uh, my view is a little more holistic. Uh, I like to, you know, India's had a background of agriculture for centuries, and I like to tap a little bit into that. And when you start to look at everything that has been happening uh, in that country, you realize that a lot of these fields, you know, sustainability, organic, biodynamic, eventually the common the commonality that exists among all of them is giving the, giving the vine, giving the plant what it needs. So that question of, you know, what does it need at that point of time, definitely for me is a practical answer. It depends on the varietal, it depends on the location, but in terms of choosing my chemicals, in terms of choosing, you know, what, when are we spraying it, how many times we're spraying it, those are very intentional decisions. And those are decisions that we deliberate on, um, on quite a bit before we actually execute them in the field. So I think I, I believe in kind of the broader range of sustainability. We definitely are, are you know, using only organic products at the field, but in terms of really defining myself in one of those categories, I think that is something that is still, uh, still going on in my head. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna have to check back in with you. <laughs> yeah. It's a big to find a new form of a uh, new form of agriculture that combines, you know, the wisdom of Indian agriculture with everything else that Western science is bringing us into. Well, obviously, have an incredible background to bring to that, so that'll be very interesting to see where you end up. <laughs> uh, Julian, I'm curious. I mean, obviously, you've made wine in Napa Valley now for like you know 15 years, I think, if my math is correct. Do you think the this new this more recent interest in Coombsville, how much has to do with say trends and climate change and how much has to do with just maybe the vineyards are being farmed a little bit better or there's more uh, investment into the area. Is climate change a, a factor or how should we think about that? Um, yeah, the, the climate change, you know, before falling into the political discussion about it is always, um, I, I think, you know, everything adds to the equation. Uh, the first one is we're still a young region and someone asking the questions about, you know, what's the impact of the winemaker and the farming techniques and the winemaking technique. For me, there is a little bit something is like you look at some estates in Europe uh, and no one knows who's the winemaker because when you change a winemaker, there is a consistency that is driven by the site and by, by what has been established. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that someone can come in and lead a technical team and really take an estate from point A to point B and really change things but there's a certain consistency that becomes the norm. And when you find that balance, that means you've kind of discovered the potential of the site. And I think we're still in that huge discovery. Uh, and that's why you get so much uh, changes when you have a technical change in, in a winery on the farming or the winemaking side. And as long as we have those huge shift, that means we still haven't found really the balance of the site and we're still discovering so many people follow us as winemaker and they like our wine, then they start following all the wines we make. And because there is a trend, 
But I think as soon as uh, we start to follow a label because of its identity, it's also what, you know, many labels change over time. And either you get new labels, you get some that disappear. But once you have something that is really an anchor for a site, this will live through the years and it will become uh, a referential and identity and then it will be timeless. And I think we're still building all this, discovering all that. And that's really the exciting part of it. And that's maybe the biggest leverage we have today beyond the weather, beyond the sites, you know, we're still discovering a lot. Yeah, um, Napa Valley is still a pretty young region relative to Bordeaux, let's say, for example. Um, I'm curious. It, 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 it doesn't evaluate the quality of the wines and the level of the rank. It's, uh, that's the thing is, we, we have an, an area where a lot of money has been invested into the winemaking, into the facility, into research. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it's really, in terms of uh, dynamic, it's, the energy is huge. Uh, and that will allow us to make wines at the level we make them. It's, it we're just, I think, uh, you, have, you have a couple of sites uh, that are still that are being discovered, you know, within 10 years where people were just driving by before. And now it's, you know, it makes wines some of the top of the valley. So it, that's the exciting part of some wine world, the artisan for that. Okay, that's a great explanation. Uh, obviously, uh, as the as the time marches on, the vintage that a lot of people want to know about is 2020. So, who wants to answer the question about 2020? What is uh, how should a, how should a, how should consumers approach this vintage? I mean, I'm happy to give my view too, but I mean, you know, um, Celia, what do you think? I mean, how should I'm going to put you on the spot? What <laughs> How do we think about 2020? It, it's a tough question. It's, it's a very difficult question. Um, I would say that if you had asked me that question uh, on August 12th of 2020, I would have said COVID has been really hard. You know, we've, we've struggled to find a safe way to do our wine production and the work in the fields. And, and we think that we've come up with that and we're, we're happy with the work that we're doing. Um, Mother Nature has been really, really good to us. And, you know, when, when winemakers see each other in, uh, you know, the grocery stores in St. Helena or Napa or whatever, we all kind of like, you know, what are you saying, blah, blah, blah. And we all kind of whisper to each other and, and everybody was quietly really, really, really excited. Um, and then the first round of fires hit and, um, there was a lot of concern and, um, some of the Sauvignon Blancs were ready to come in and some of them, you know, may have even come in before the first round of fires, but, um, certainly I was able to get a couple of, of, of rounds of harvesting organized quickly and, and, you know, let's get them in before we lose anything here. And some of those wines are absolutely gorgeous. And I know that many of my colleagues have beautiful, beautiful wines. Um, there, were, there were fires that started on, I think it was August 17th with a, a round of dry lightning that lit fires up and down the state and all the way up into the Northwest as well. Um, those burned in Napa for almost a month. We had about 10 days of clear skies and then there was another round. And, you know, I mean, this all of this was national news. Um, and, and there were places again that you know if you've got if you've got wind patterns that are blowing the smoke away from your vineyard and um, you were able to get really clean fruit into the winery, I think that you came away with a absolutely stunningly beautiful wine. If unfortunately you you know the wind patterns in your particular place were not right or that the fruit was already soft enough that the skins were were soft and and could absorb the fruit the smoke more easily. Um, you're going to see a little more effect from the smoke there. So there's going to be a little bit of a patchwork quilt and um, some wineries likely will not have a vintage um, and some may have a brilliant product. I, it's just going to be, it's going to be proceed with caution, I think, and, and wait and see, but, but hats off to the people that, that really got on it and, and made some nice wines. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's a great answer. I mean, I think, from tasting these wines, not just Napa wines, but wines from all over the world. Um, obviously, it's a especially dramatic sort of situation, but it is really case by case. 
And it has to do a lot of things with a lot of things. Some of the things you mentioned, Celia, about location and where the wind is, but also the pr producer preference for like when you want to pick and how you've set up your vineyard to respond to the year. I mean, there's just a lot of nuances. And, and so I think it is, we're going to have to just wait and see. But, you know, um, I tasted some beautiful 17s and obviously 20, 20 is more dramatic, but um, it'll be just interesting to see, but I think it's, you have to keep an open mind and taste. It's gonna be really wine by wine and property by property. So, you know, fingers crossed and hope for the best. You know, I think that you have to, hopefully, you know, this is, um, I don't think any region lives on a single vintage. And you know, I'll tell you a story when I, in 2017, right after the harvest, I went to Screaming Eagle and, um, at the time they were thinking they weren't gonna bottle any wine, but they, they told me that they wanted to vinify some grapes that they thought were tainted, with, they were smoke tainted because they thought this was gonna become a, a recurring issue challenge for people to deal with. And I thought, Armando McGray, the general manager, I thought he was a little pessimistic, but he turned out to be 100% right. And, and I think part of the challenge for winemakers is there's not much understood about the testing of smoke, about these compounds. Um, because they're the same compounds that are found in the toast of oak barrels. There are um, wineries that have sent, uh, that I know have sent wines that they know have no smoke taint, but they show up with those compounds because of something in the soil, perhaps. Uh, in mountain AVAs like Atlas Peak or Howell Mountain, those wines often have a charred, kind of smoky, gamey quality anyway, even when they're must. Uh, we don't know if these compounds, if they can unbind or bind over time. And I, I just think there's a tremendous uh, amount of learning that has to happen. So I, I think you have to think about, I hope people will think, think of 2020 as a, a point in an arc, as opposed to like a destination. It's I think uh, a lot of, hopefully a lot of learning will come out of this and that there'll be a lot of really great lessons. But because I know that, you know, uh, if, if you take your, your, a fruit sample to a lab and you're not going to get an answer back for five weeks, it doesn't matter what the answer is because you have to make a decision but before then. And so you're making, it's like, you know, you're flying an airplane, but you've got no controls. You're just going to go on instinct. And, you know, that'll work a lot of the time, but, you know, it'd be much better to know. And so I think this is the story of 2020 is really kind of using this to kind of get to the next level of understanding, just like you, you know, still you were talking before, but everybody on this panel has talked about the improvements in farming and having more data available today. Hopefully there'll be more data available on this, you know, less pleasant subject, um, you know, as we move forward. Um, and so, and so I think it would be fun to just, um, you know, because the Napa Valley, so thank you. So that was very candid and very appreciated. Um, and, uh, but I think um, we're up against our time limit almost. So I think it'd be fun to just go over some of the lots that you've each contributed because they're amazing. And, um, and I just to talk a little bit about the wines that are in here. Um, and I'm just gonna go through the, through, the, um, through the lots for a second. So the, the Schaefer lot is an incredible collection of 15 vintages of Hillside Select, the flagship wine from 2000 to 2000. 14, so that's 15 magnums. That's an incredible lot, Elias and Doug. So um, super generous to contribute that. Um, and, um, and the Signorello lot is, um, there's a three double magnums, 2002, 2003, 2004, plus a virtual tasting with Priyanka. My guess is if you ask her, she'll open a few more. Um, so I just put you on the spot there. But um, I know I will take any chance I get to open library <laughs> wines because I'm just trying to learn. So yes, I would. Um, right. But I'd love to just give a little um, introduction to why we chose those three vintages, if you don't mind, Antonio. No, not at all. So, uh, you know, 02, 03, and 04 in general were considered pretty great vintages for Napa across the board. Uh, and for Signorello, they're a little bit of a, you know, a little bit more of a significance because the, the fire and Signorello story has been very well defined in the 2017 vintage, but that was actually not the, you know, it wasn't at the winery's first brush with the fire. We were actually affected by the Wine Central fire, which was a warehouse where a lot of wineries would store their products. And we lost the O2 and the O3 vintage as a part of that uh, warehouse fire. And so there's only about 10 cases which 
were the library wines that were at an alternate location that are left of those two vintages of the O2 and the O3 specifically. Uh, and, and, and all the rest that we have is all in large format. So it's a really special vintage for us. And I think the trio, you know, I had a chance to take all three of them while choosing which vintage to uh, present at this panel. And I chose the O3 because I truly thought it was the O2 that would kind of, you know, be, it would steal the show, but the O3 stood out and it stood on its own. And as a winemaker, I think I appreciate those, the quieter years more. And I thought it was drinking really well. And so I just wanted to share that little story with everyone. Well, I'm glad you did because you mentioned two things that are really important. The first is that the, the less lauded vintage may turn out in time to be the wine that gives you the most satisfaction. But yesterday we tasted an O1 from Fremark Abbey and, and Christy Melton was saying, you know, she'd chosen a one and she didn't really say it, but, but, you know, she could choose whichever vintage she wanted. And I remember tasting the O ones and the O twos a lot because it was right when I had joined the wine advocate and I did those 10 year retrospectives with Bob Parker. And, you know, you taste all the O ones and all the O twos. And, and it was very clear that O one was the more interesting vintage, but that was not at all the case when these wines were first released. And so that's a very interesting a lesson for all of us to keep in mind that the most famous quote unquote vintage may not be the wine that after 20 years gives you the most pleasure. And then um, obviously these wines are super rare because almost all of them was destroyed in fires, which takes us back to our previous topic. But, you know, on that, I should just add that, you know, the point of this auction is to, is, is to raise funds that will help safeguard the future of Napa Valley. So if you're concerned about fires, one thing you can definitely do is bid generously on these lots. Uh, all right, so let's look at the Rewa lot. Um, and uh, Celia, you have some really beautiful wines in here too. Um, I love the 9 million years in the winemaking theme. Um, four <laughs> magnums, 15, 16, 17, and 18. So that's a really great lot too for somebody who wants to get to learn these wines, you know, right from the very beginning. Yeah, uh, right, from the, right from the beginning of the Rewa story, although this was an existing vineyard and that was how my connection with that site uh, came about. I had been, uh, this was a, a prior ownership was uh, farming and selling fruit. Um, and I had a client who was buying some out of there for a little while. And um, at some point there was a question about vineyard management and Mike Wolf came in and, uh, you know, of course, just immediately the quality of the fruit just immediately just jumped tenfold. Um, yeah. So when, um, when that owner passed away and Serena and Rewa Singh purchased the vineyard, um, they asked Mike if, if he had a recommendation on a wine maker uh, that could work with this fruit. And he said, I know somebody who already has. Um, and the opportunity to work with Mike again and that great site was, was wonderful. So even though this was my, even though 15 is the first vintage of my effort for Rewa, it was not my first run with those grapes. And, uh, it was nice to come out with a new brand that where I, I really felt confident in knowing exactly how to handle this and what it could become. So um, it, it, 15 was not a trial run by any stretch. It's a, it's a really strong first step into the market for this new brand. Okay, so that explains a lot of what's in the glass, which I didn't really understand the full context at first. So thanks for sharing that. And uh, it just occurs to me, Elias, that I skipped over you when I talked about your lot, but you had so many wines, but O to 14, what, how do we think about 15 magnums? And we got a lot of, have a lot of friends, right? Oh yeah, yeah, you better have a lot of friends. Um, you know, the, um, the Schaefer's have always been generous with the Napa Valley Vintners. It started with John Schaefer. You spoke about meeting him for the first time. I mean, he was one of the chairs a long time ago. And, uh, and so, you know, it was uh, an all out effort to give something that would, uh, you know, make some money for the organization. Uh, you know, wine of a place, uh, speaks of the vintages, speaks of Napa Valley. So it's a, it's a fun lot. Um, you know, it's a, um, you know, 2003 as, you know, uh, it was just mentioned is one of my favorites in there too. It's, it's, a, it's come around and uh, it should be showing well. So got some good stuff in there for ageability and for drinking now and for aging for many years to come. Yeah, cool. Um, and then and then the Perlieu lot is really cool too, because here is, again is the opportunity to compare two vintages, uh, 2013 and 2014 in this case. Uh, you know, 13, everybody knows, you know, very rich, powerful structure. 
14 is always more linear, but you know, that goes back to our discussion. Who, who knows in um, when these wines are 20 years old, which vintage is going to be the more interesting one? Because 14 always has this incredible finish and this incredible brightness. And uh, I don't exclude that in, you know, in, uh, in another 15 or so years, that it may be that the 14s are, are slightly ahead of the 13s. I mean, I don't think of wine as competition, like want something being better than not better, but um, certainly interesting. And Julian, you have an amazing lot here because you have the 13 and the 14 of your two serving year in Coonsville. You have a case of 12 bottles for each of those vintages, and then um, a double magnum and a six liter. So that's a lot of wine in the cellar. Um, so a very generous uh, the, the, the idea behind it was to, uh, for the collectors, you know, comparing side by side, fast forwarding, you know, what's great for the vineyards if we, we go dig in the cellar and open doors that usually you can't open. And also, you know, if you want to answer the question about how it ages in the different formats, you're going to be able to do that. So it's, it's pretty cool. I think the 13 is, you know, classic vintage. Uh, it's big, it's powerful. It's actually less drinkable right now than the 14 because they are so tight and so powerful. That the 14 is, was pretty dark and pretty muted aromatically. And you see all the, all the bouquet on the nose starting to develop and really uh, fresh aromatics, not an aromatic necessarily of evolution, but still in the maturity of the wine. And that's a very slow movement over time. That's super interesting. And so a vintage that was a little bit in the shadow of 13, I think is starting to really show off. Awesome. Well, that's a great explanation. So, well, it's, I just want to, I'd like to, first of all, thank the four of you for your time this afternoon. It's always a pleasure to be able to sit down and talk about wine and farming without having to taste a slew of wines and you know, <laughs> some sort of schedule. So it's, it's great to have this time with you. So thanks so much for your time. I want to thank our audience. I think at, at peak, we had more than 150 people dialed in and that's just live. There'll be many more views, obviously on replay. Fantastic questions. I wish we could have gotten to all of them, but you know, it's a good occasion to maybe think about another group of Napa Valley, um, another, another group of, of Napa Valley sessions. Uh, we've got one more seminar coming up tomorrow to the slightly different time, 5.30 Pacific, 8.30 Eastern. We're going to look at some of the unexplored varieties of Napa Valley. Some of these are the historic varieties, Petit Syrah, uh, Zinfandel, and so on. A great panel as well. It's going to be really fun. Uh, and so I'd like to thank the Napa Valley Vintners for hosting this, the Zaki's for running the auction, and just remind everybody that bidding is, is open, and to please bid generously on these amazing, on these amazing wines, these amazing lots. So Thanks everyone for your time. Cheers. We'll see you tomorrow. Cheers. Thanks, Thank you so much for having us. You're welcome. Bye-bye.